Uh, Diana Pinto, uh, you're the only real scholar around this uh, panel. Maybe, yeah. may, maybe no, tell no, us, no. maybe tell us what we don't know. <laughs> well, I think I would like to start with this. Well, first of all, to answer your question, uh, then. is this on? Are you here? Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, I think willy-nilly there will be further, greater integration inside the European continent because I don't see any viable alternative. But I would like to start with a historical irony. The I'm sorry, I don't have a clock in front of me. No, you don't. And you, your time is up. Thank you. Is anybody in charge of this clock? Here we Thank go. you. All right, Wonderful. Here you go. Now here you go. Sorry. Uh, I would like to start with a historical irony. When Jean Monnet and the founding fathers of Europe decided to produce the European model, they concentrated on what seemed rock-hard rock economics, solid and real, because they were afraid to touch upon anything else so shortly after World War II, and therefore coal and steel. Coal has disappeared. Steel belongs to Mittal. Germany's major trading partner is no longer its wife or husband, as you wish to say. I, wish I, I assume in sexist terms, France is the wife. Um, but the major trading partner is China, practically. And so in this enormous scaffolding that was made after the war, is the euro the little flag on top that one puts, workers put, before the entire building is finished, floating in the wind, or is there something else behind it? And that is the question. Are there Europeans? As an Italian, I can tell you that when Cavour made Italy, he said Italy has been made, we now have to make the Italians. Whether the Italians exist today is another issue. But the point is here, has anything happened behind that scaffolding in the 50-odd years? I would like to say yes. I think there are Europeans. What's sorely lacking is the political will of their political leaderships to carry them forward. They're following rather than proceeding, as should have been. But let's be optimistic. I do believe in the power of the metaphors of sport. We're currently in the midst of the Euro. Greece did not leave the Euro yet that euro, but more important, in political terms of saying of a breakup, when Greece encounters Germany tomorrow night, this will be a major punching line for metaphors for journalists, but it will have nothing to do and nothing in common with the Czechoslovak Soviet hockey match of 1969, in which national pride, humiliation, rage, anger, and domination were at stake. And this is, I think, important. Now, beyond that element, as just a metaphor, I would like to say that there are more things in common among Europeans inside their respective nation states than many people envisage. And I would like to include here the UK as well. Because something has happened whereby London has left the UK, not unlike the way New York City doesn't really belong to New York State. There's a lot of poverty out there in the UK, and the London macro cannot hide it. Now, what do bring together the European citizens inside their national boxes? First of all, and I would distinguish them here from their American, North American counterparts, willy-nilly, and the two go together, either a belief in reference to a series of universal values and transcendent international cooperative agreements, <coughs> with the opposite, of course, the return of xenophobia, Secularism as an ideal and practice and a majority. An individualistic notion of rights that go against church implied or American-like notions that you can interfere because it's a religious duty. And above all, a high sense of social justice and even across the UK, mother of capitalism, a tepid love and even disdain for this capitalist market economy that makes you exist in order to work. Now, concretely, what does this mean? Across Europe, there's an absolute requirement that is a basic of medical insurance and the belief that the ter terrible falls of life really belong to the state protection. A notion of pensions that should make you end your life in a worthy manner. And a genuine notion that one does live for something more than work. And it's not a small detail, this notion of vacations, because even the most cynical Eurosceptic somewhere in the UK, will be vacationing with euros in his or her pocket as he or she takes EasyJet. 
which has become the grand unifier of Europe more than anything else across Europe. Now, what I would like to say here is, and this is my hunch, that Europeans will be willing to pay a price to keep these essential elements of their collective identities. In other words, if need be, they'll be taxed more and they'll go back to basics, you know, move one cog on their belts and live more austerely rather than to give up these kinds of models. Now, it's not macroeconomics, this is social daily life. And if you look at, and I think this entire epoch will be defined by the walls on which people write, especially in Spain, elsewhere when the city walls, there is this element of be indignez-vous, which was Stefan Hessel's major notion. Stop and rethink. We've got to rethink something. Now, if the political elites were able to play on this, they might be able to do some heavy thinking, which they haven't done recently. Now, there is an element of hope on that front, as far as I'm concerned. The new generations of Europeans have traveled widely, studied in each other's countries, understand the world more beyond than anything else that has happened in the previous years. We are now reaching with a younger generation, perhaps incarnated even by Mario Draghi, who studied abroad and who is eloquent and perfectly fluent in a complex world, much more so than perhaps some of his older uh, predecessors. Now, is this a recipe for great hope? I'm not so sure, but there's not much of an alternative there. And in the end, the Germans and the Greeks might have more in common than just a football match. And finally, I would like to end on this particular moment by simply saying that today's cartoon in the New York Times sums it all. We have great reasons to rejoice. Fear has just won over despair. And I do believe that fear is a very useful and important motor to get people who are on the brinks to come together and realize that there are deeper values than just the stock market. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, Ambassador uh, Andreas Michaelis, uh, as I insinuated in my opening uh, uh, quote, uh, you were a, a, a close associate of Joschka Fischer, who is, uh, I think, in, even in German history, uh, remains as one of the strongest Europhiles, uh, strongest uh, uh, fighters for European integration. Um, Twelve years after that, uh, after that uh, speech, which I even believe you uh, you participated in uh, authoring, uh, how how does the perspective look twelve years on with the with the earthquake that is uh, uh, making Europe tremble? Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, I will I will come to that point, but allow me to start simply by saying uh, how much I liked the statement of Martin Wolf, which was moderate, reasonable, including his remarks about integration, that the jury is still out whether we succeed in achieving more integration in the European Union. But that is only up to the point where he suddenly started to speak about Germany. <laughs> and I think a few points uh, uh, need to be uh, straightened in that respect. Uh, as one of the founding members of the European Union, uh, Germany has developed an identity in the post-war years that rests on two pillars. One, as the nation-state it is, including all the positive aspects of that identity, as well as responsibility uh, for the dark chapters of German history. One also as a member of the European Union, which is to say that of being an integral part of a larger political entity. So I believe that due to the unique development of Germany, uh, basically reconstructing a de democracy or building a democracy in Germany after the trauma of the Second World War, uh, we very much were interested in a constitutional vision of our state and it just matched the development of the European Union that there again uh, we were faced with building and pursuing a constitutional project and realizing a constitutional identity. I don't think there are many countries in Europe, many member states of the European Union, where people in the street, if you talk to them, uh, and you talk to them in a serious way, are able 
to identify with that European project, which is part of their own identity. It follows from this that Germany is driven by the most essential self-interest when it supports the project of the European Union or other members in the Eurozone. By supporting them, it supports itself. Contrary to this observation, Germany has come under very significant pressure throughout the Eurozone crisis. Some of our outspoken critics present us as ungenerous or dogmatically wedded to prescriptions of austerity. This totally overlooks Germany's strong commitment towards the Union, and I would like to make five points in that respect. First, Germany has made a very substantial contribution in the context of the Euro rescue efforts and Euro stabilization. I don't want to bore you with figures, just one indication with a share of 27%. Germany is by far the largest contributor to the rescue facilities. For Greece, we have provided 22.4 billion euros a few years ago. That would have been an impressive figure. And further, 211 billion euros for the EF. SF. To put that into perspective, that amounts to 10% of German GDP. Second, German leadership in Europe is not something we naturally aspire to. On the contrary, in the past, we have often shown ourselves reluctant to lead, something I don't have to explain at great length to an audience in Israel. The historical and political background for this is obvious. However, in the present circumstances, we have accepted our responsibility, but accepting a responsibility and acting on it confronts with a special dilemma in the present crisis. And I would call that dilemma the dialectic of leadership. And that is something uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel is confronted with. The dialectic simply is that she has to uh, think up and implement European policy with a mandate that is a national mandate. She will have to return to the German voter with a policy that she is also pushed to design in an exclusively uh, European perspective. But the question whether that is acceptable to the German taxpayer, whether that is acceptable to the man in the street and the woman in the street is a question that simply presents a dilemma, and so it is very much a question of compromising between those two tasks, to stabilize Europe and at the same time to pursue a policy that is something you can sell to the German taxpayer. Third, austerity versus growth. Very often the present questions have been presented um, as the difference between a policy that is focused on austerity and Germany very much uh, is said to push that policy and a growth uh, policy. These are certainly not mutually exclusive concepts or policies. What is important, we are supporting growth initiatives, but they need to be embedded in their own interest, in sound policies of reform. And that definitely includes, in the case of many member states of the European Union, structural reforms. Fourth point, Germany and the political future of the European Union. I simply would like to quote my Chancellor on this. She recently said, we need more than a monetary union. We also need a fiscal union, which is to say a common budget policy. And what we need first and foremost is a political union, which is to say that step by step, we have to delegate national competences to Europe in order to also provide for the necessary control mechanisms at European level. Fifth point, where does it leave us? The question in my mind is not, does Europe drift towards unity or towards division? The question is, what is the balance between unity and division, or it would be better to speak of difference uh, because we as Germans are not really afraid of moving towards integration because we really see integration as a, an absolute alternative to traditional policies. And because it is an absolute alternative, uh, we also see uh, that 
uh, uh, in this context of unity, uh, something is preserved that is the old nation state. Federalism does not mean the absolute disappearance of the old European nation state. Last remark, the right mix is the crucial question, the right mi mix between unity and difference. And in our view, this should happen through the right mix of fiscal consolidation, growth initiatives, and a deepening of European cooperation. Thank you.